Good morning to you. The voice you're hearing is that of Father Joseph Campbell. I'm the rector of St. John's Episcopal Parish in South Salem, New York. What you're looking at is the front doors of St. John's Church. You'll notice there is a Christmas wreath attached to the door. Um, right before Christmas, actually Christmas Eve itself, a huge storm went through the area. Many people lost power. The second wreath was caught up in the wind and we still haven't found it. And I thought I would use this as an introduction for you to welcome you to our church and also to give you this as a sort of a symbol of who and what we are. At the moment, after almost a year living with COVID and its uh, aftermath, the fact that we can't gather still battered, not quite complete, but we're still here. And I want to welcome each and every one of you into to this parish, welcome you to our worship. On Sunday mornings at 9.30, we celebrate Eucharist in a safe environment. Uh, pews are marked, spatially set apart. People wear masks. We all wear gloves. I wear gloves. We worship as best we can, but we want to welcome each and every one of you to this online YouTube service as well for those of you who find comfort in worshiping in our virtual community. There will come a time this year in 2021, hopefully when we'll gather together again. But until that time, welcome, be a part of this. I hope this spiritually feeds you. If you have the opportunity and feel up to it, feel free to come to any of the in-person services as well. Always remembering the church is not this building or any building. The church is the community of those gathered in Jesus' name who pray as he taught us to pray who minister and worship and love as he taught us to do so. So welcome to this worship. Welcome to our time together in spirit and in truth. And good morning, everyone. This morning, we, we are celebrating the fourth Sunday within the season of Epiphany. Um, it is the end of January, January 31st. Thank you for being a part of this Eucharistic service. So I'm going to ask you to put aside, put away for the moment all of the things that are on your plate, all of the things you have to do. Put ourselves in the Lord's presence. Let's relax. Let's enjoy. And I think you will find the readings completely baffling, utterly boring, but very, very thought-provoking. So let us begin in prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue using from morning prayer the canticle from the book of Revelation, Canticle 18. Together let us pray. Splendor and honor and kingly power are yours by right, O Lord our God. For you created everything that is, 
and by your will they were created and have their being. And yours by right, O Lamb that was slain, for with your blood you have redeemed for God from every family, language, people, and nation a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And to so, so to him who sits upon the throne and to Christ the Lamb, be worship and praise, dominion and splendor, forever and forevermore. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name, a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. His work is full of majesty and splendor, and his righteousness endures forever. He makes his marvelous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who act accordingly have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. The first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. 
Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, they might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The final reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples went into Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and he taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Now just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit who cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent. Come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of the man. They were all amazed. They kept on asking one another, Who is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits. And they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I gave you a little tease in the introduction, and I said that I was going to focus on Readings that don't always make a lot of sense, or at least don't make a lot of sense to us, but I also said that it was going to be very, very, I think, appropriate for our time. So let me begin by giving you a statement, and what I'm, the information I'm going to share with you, or the, uh, the reflection, is going to start off with something, I, I wish I were this snarky, and I wish I were this talented and this witty, but I'm not. I'm taking this from a book I read many, many years ago. It's called Ministry Loves Company you know, as opposed to Misery Loves Company. Um, so the author had this, this kind of witty um, reflection. He talked about church, and he started off with the premise, a very true premise. The church is one of the most messy and disorganized and splintered of all human communities. I want an organized community, one that's really organized, like a cemetery. Now think, think about it, don't laugh. Cemeteries are the pinnacle for order and getting things done in right ways. Look, cemeteries know how to receive new members. They receive them with solemn ceremony. There is an organizational chart probably either on a wall in the office or in the computer banks somewhere that explains where all the, where all the uh, members, where they stand, or like, as, as you might say. Membership is marked by quiet. There are no conflicts among the members of the seminary. No one encroaches on anyone else's turf. No one gets mad. Nobody complains. Nobody threatens to withhold their pledge. Nobody says, I'm going to quit and go to another cemetery. It's the most organized place in town. And yet, there's not a lot of life there. So let me ask you a question. Two readers who read beautifully, two sisters, Georgia and Riley Shabbat. Georgia, I burdened with reading, asking her to read the second reading from 1 Corinthians, which is a classic, um, one of the more important, uh, <coughs> excuse me, letters of the New Testament. And it's really, um, it has to do with something which we would consider just so stupid and so nonsensical. Now, churches, of course, can fight about everything, but this church was imploding, 
over an issue that we would just kind of scratch our heads and say, what, why, you know? 400,000 people have died of the COVID virus. Why are we arguing about this, of all things? Why do we bother to read as the inspired word of God a reflection from Paul to this community that he founded, that he's now writing to? And it has to do with, with food. And it's not about recipes and watching things on the Food Channel. It has to do with the appropriateness of eating certain foods that have been used in religious rites and that are now been sold on the open market. And, well, what is this all about? Hear me out. In the ancient world, and not just in the Roman world, but in the ancient world, for the most part, foods were offered in sacrifice to the gods. Okay? You would take a piece of meat or vegetables or whatever you were offering, grain, whatever, and you would give a portion of that to be incinerated, and that was the sacrifice that was offered to the gods. You were returning to God in thanksgiving for what you have been given. It's a form of prayer, okay? Now, the whole thing wasn't incinerated. A portion would have been roasted and then given to the people to take home to participate in the meal. A portion would have been given to the priest, okay, for in lieu of their service. Personally, I'd rather get paid or get tickets to City Field rather than be given a piece of incinerated liver or entrails of yak or whatever, but that's, that's you know, whatever you want. But the final and largest portions would have been given to the markets for sale. Now, here's the problem. There were within this Christian community in Corinth, since all of them ultimately were recent converts because this was a community that Paul founded, there were these new Christians that felt that eating meat that had taken part in a religious ritual to pagan gods was a little too scandalous, that this food would be unclean, and if they participated in it, they were doing something sinful or wrong or unclean. Now, what Paul writes to them, and he says, and follow his thinking, because it's really important, and says something about our own culture. He says to them, look, you all know pagan gods don't exist. I can say this in a very inappropriate way. There ain't no Zeus, there ain't no Hera, there ain't no Thor, there ain't no Mercury. You know, names on a page, nothing, okay? Eating food that's dedicated to what doesn't exist doesn't amount to anything. It's indifferent, it doesn't matter. Those rites have no meaning. But, and here's the but, okay? There were those who argued we should eat. It's fine to eat the food. There were those who argued it's wrong to eat the food. The community's being torn apart. And what Paul the pastor and the psychologist not just the missionary who founds the community. He writes to them and says, now look, all right? We all know that this food is not really blessed, it's not consecrated, it's not sacrilegious, it's nothing, it's just meat. The, the service that happened doesn't mean anything. But if, if eating this food, which is fine if you want to do that, if eating the food causes anguish to a sister or brother, then don't do it. Look. You're right, they're stupid, we acknowledge this. But be sensitive, do the loving thing. And his advice is just so opposite what we do in our own culture. In our culture, we're fond of our rights. I have a right, I have an entitlement. Whether it's the right to the school, or right to a gun, or right, having freedom means I have the right always to make choices. We're not used to telling us that freedom isn't just about making choices. Freedom is also about choosing to do or not do what is for the benefit of others. And that's part of being free as well. We think freedom is only about choosing to have this or that thing. You know, go into a stop and shop and God forbid we don't have all the various brands that we're used to. Oh yeah, then the COVID hit us and we found out we could go to a store and Instead of having 11 different brands of toilet paper to fight over, there was nothing. So what good was our freedom? What's the point? Paul says freedom is not only about having choices. Freedom comes from how I choose to live with my brother and sister. How we live together in community. How we choose to care for each other be responsible for each other, to be bound to each other and to Christ 
through Christ and in Christ. That's the real freedom of choice. So, getting back to my original point, yeah, churches are messy. Church communities are messy. I've been a priest for going on to my 46th year. Churches are messy. You will find within the congregation, within the church boards, whether they're called a parish council or a vestry or a board, differing views, different practices, differing theologies, different languages, different customs. And you'll hear all the theories on what makes a church grow. At least you used to hear that in the pre-COVID world. Churches grow when you teach the truth about Jesus, when you use the tools for marketing, when you have a good, astute administration and planning, when they offer programs, when we need to know what worshipers need. We, churches will grow when God will send us enough parking places. But over and above any of that stuff, churches grow when there is love. When we learn to, as Paul will write to these people in a later chapter of the same letter, the reading we always hear at weddings, which isn't really about um, the wedding love of, of two people. It's really about how communities are supposed to treat each other. When we realize that love is patient and kind, it is not envious, it is not boastful or proud or arrogant or rude. When we protect each other, trust one another, persevere with each other, and we place each other in God's hands. When we pray for one another and let others reach out and pray for us. Paul knew to how to be alive with the church. It doesn't mean everyone is going to agree. It doesn't mean we're always going to see things in the same way. But it does mean we make Christ and we make each other the center of our lives, the center of the community. Because in the end, being a Christian means, God help us, we're a family. Or, God help us, we are a family. Let us profess our faith. Please join with me with the insert. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We gather in your name, Lord Jesus, because we know who you are, and you know our deepest needs, you know our weaknesses, and we look to you in hope. Holy One of God, hear our prayers. The world is hurting and restless for you. The earth is stressed and cries out for protection. Its peoples cry out in hunger and fear. We turn to you in our need for deliverance. We pray for your church as it walks your way of life. May your people and leaders know deeply your loving, liberating, and life-giving presence. We pray for those who govern all over the world, that they may pursue justice and practice peace. Equip them with the courage and the resources to respond to the needs of all people. For those who have lost their freedom to addiction, for those who wrestle with worry, for those who struggle with mobility, communication, and relationship, for those who are sick, for those who face surgery or treatments, for those who will soon give birth, for those who have lost a pregnancy, we look to you for care to care for all those, to give them hope through your presence. 
and we commend to you the souls of all who have died and ask you to comfort those whose hearts ache with grief. Let us hold in prayer members of our parish family who are first responders and those in the medical profession. Daniel Reardon, Elise Atkin Brandt, Kelly Ross, Marjorie Jean Michelle, Nerissa Joyner, Christopher Skagen, Elena Aristade, Ellie and Aaron Levitt, John Lafata, Barbara Thompson, Kristen Smith, Kimberly Bruin, Caitlin Bruin, Kyle Tompkins, Jackson Shavats, Paul DeMore, Chris Beckett, Maya Bissonette, Brittany Jordan. We pray for the teachers of our parish, Claire Beckett, Jenny Cox, Claudia Nero. Please hold in prayer the following people who are sick. Sharon Scanlon, Jack Porches, Marissa Cardinal, Myra Slavens, the Reverend Lynn and Joe McQuaid, the Nielsen family, Mike Harris, Michael and Mary Ann Albanese, John Carrington, Meridian Carrington, Rob and Jennifer King, Zach Brown, Cynthia Leo and Oliver Monaco, Alvida Alford and family, Carly and Nestor Aparicio, Charles Silvestri, Mike Lafada, Lauren Ross, Lindsay Hepler. And together let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And may Almighty God have mercy upon you, forgive you of all of your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, Keep you in everlasting life. Amen. And may the Lord's peace be with each one of you. We'll continue now with the Liturgy of Eucharist, and you may follow along with the answer. Eucharistic Prayer A. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is a right, good, and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross. He offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it 
gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer to you these gifts. Sanctify them for your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And on the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Together, let us offer praise and pray to the Father as Jesus himself taught us how. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Now send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Before our final blessing, just a couple of... Um, we're to our sponsor. Number one, if you have not had the opportunity yet to return your pledge card or information about your pledge for the upcoming year, you're encouraged to please do so. Um, secondly, you all should have received ballots for voting for vestry, so I'm going to ask each of you to please fill in your ballot and please get it into the mail as soon as possible so that we can actually do a better job with our election than the federal government did with theirs, with a lot less controversy and a lot more rapidly. And thirdly and finally, even as the winter continues, we keep each other in prayers, we hold each other tight, and we hold each other in, in our hearts. 
offering prayer to the Lord for our own safety. If you've been able to be vaccinated, God bless you, good for you. If you have not, like myself, please pray for us, okay? And may God Almighty bless each one of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As the family of Christ, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.